Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining this SEMA edition of Shop Talk Live. Today, we're going to cover some of the basics for aluminum TIG welding. Uh, so my name is Travis Witters. I'm a welding engineer here with Miller Electric. I'm also joined with Andy Weinberg. He's our aftermarket and performance manager that we you typically see out at SEMA. Um, you'll also hear for anybody on YouTube, we're going to connect to the chat. We're going to ask some questions. Um, any questions that you guys have, feel free to throw those in the chat. James is on the line. He's going to be your voice directly to us so we can answer as many of those questions live as we can. Um, we're also actually live from the SEMA floor as well. And so if we transition over here real quick, they're, come, they're going to take a little bit of a tour. So we've got Josh behind the camera for anybody in the booth is your direct connection to us for questions live from the SEMA floor. And Rex is going to give us a little bit of a, a tour through the SEMA booth here. Go, Rex, go. All right. Hey, I'm Rex. I'm here with uh, Miller Electric at the uh, booth at SEMA, uh, booth number 23113. And I'm just going to kind of show you a little bit about what we have on the floor. We've got a nice little uh, Multimatic 220 AC DC machine in one of the corners here. I'd love to talk to you about it if you want to stop by. Uh, it's a multi-process machine, stick tig mig it'll do your ac dc applications aluminum steel stainless chromoly whatever you whatever you want to do it's a great little shop machine so we're going to move over here we've got a little bit bigger guy another multi-matic this is the multi-matic 255 uh, again multi-process stick tig mig but it's going to be dc only but it'll it'll handle all of your welding needs for building those cars projects whatever you've got going Next, we'll move over here. We've got some disc gloves on display as well. We also have uh, some welding helmets. So come by, check them out, try them on if you if you like. Uh, we're going to kind of work our way in the booth, show you some of the other hoods that we have. <clears throat> We've got all the way from our uh, kind of entry level, if you would, helmets here, moving up to our more professional ones, just depending on what kind of feature set that you would like to see and use. So I got a price point almost for everybody. So come check out our welding helmets. We'd be happy to show you about them. Over here, another on one of the other corners, we have our nice little Spectrum 625, which is a great little plasma cutter cut up to 5 8 material. And then right next to it, we have a nice little MIG machine. This is our Millermatic 211. The unique thing about this one, it allows you to go up 115 volt or 230 volt, but it's a, a nice little uh, entry level um, wire feed machine. Okay. Uh, over here in the, the other corner, we have another Multimatic 220. That's one of our more popular machines these days. And it's uh, getting a nice review right now all on its own. So uh, again, 23113 is our booth number. Come by and see us. We've got a lot of people here that would love to talk to you. Thanks, Rex. So a little bit of a the nickel tour of the SEMA booth. So anybody who is there live in the booth, again, Josh is your direct connection to us for questions. For anybody who sticks around to the end, we're also going to ask a few questions about what you learned along the way and got a chance to win some free swag. So stick around for anybody who is on YouTube. Again, that's going to come through the chat. So get ready to connect with James there. Um, to get started, though, we're going to go through a little bit about the basics of what we would typically see as questions coming through the floor at SEMA about getting set up um, you know, the aluminum TIG welding is something that we see day in and day out, a lot of users getting into. Um, so we'd like to cover the basics of, you know, anything from the torch to material prep, all the way on up to some of the basic settings that are going to make you a lot more successful when you start welding TIG on aluminum. So we're going to start, Andy's going to talk a little bit about the torch and the parts that we have in the torch for a standard <clears throat> air-cooled setup on what you would find on something like the 220. Yeah, right. So if you look at that picture that Traz got, I have a, a sample piece myself. Um, basically, there's some major parts of the torch that have to be sized to the type of consumables that you're working with. So you got your cup right on the end that screws off. And underneath the cup, you've got a collet and collet body. Now, these two parts, these are sized for whatever size tungsten you're working with. So that's critical. Uh, you you're want to make sure that you've got the proper size tungsten in here because if you have one that's the right size and one that's not, and you try to tighten your back cap down, the back cap actually tightens against the collet and collet body and thereby pinches the tungsten into place. So that's not gonna happen properly if you have mismatched consumables here. Now we call them consumables, 
you know, if you use them properly, you're really not going to consume them, but they are technically considered consumables. And, uh, the in one place of the torch. Oh, just want to note on that real quick for, for you guys, if you get started or anybody who's on that has ever got to the point where you go to remove that tungsten to dress it and it's sticking inside and you're going to tap it out or uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. If you've ever tried to tighten it up and that tungsten won't actually grab it, just slides right back out. That's going to be an issue where maybe that collet got overheated. So again, not they're truly considered a consumable for that reason. That copper gets too hot, loses its spring. So that's one of the point, you know, that's your main point of electrical connection. So that's something that if you see a couple of those issues happening, changing that collet out is going to get you back to where you want to be uh, mm -hmm. as far as getting set up. So go ahead, Andy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I see the collet having to be changed way more than the collet body, unless you just totally stick a filler metal or something in there to actually contaminate that but you could have that now the back cap the back cap screws on and off and actually has the same thread and thread pitch as the collet body uh, but uh that tightens up against the collet and collet body to hold that tungsten in like Trav said now there's different sizes of this back cap now this is a full length one which holds a full length piece of tungsten It'll go all the way up that back cap. Um, however, there are other ones available as well. Like I'm using a kind of a medium one. There's also a kind of a flush cap you can get as well. Now, now I'm actually having to cut my tungsten to the proper size to fit in here. I just like using the smaller back caps because it just it's something less that could get hung up on something as I'm welding. I'm usually, you know deep in a car trying to do something and that big long back cap kind of gets in the way so i prefer the medium one or even the small little button cap so that's kind of your main components of the torch i guess the the biggest takeaway i would say there is just make sure that your collet collet bodies match the tungsten size that you're working with and i know you'll probably show that modular torch here coming up in a little bit too but also keep in mind it's not just a back cap that changes configurations too if you guys start getting into you know heads are real common things like that where you need to get better access you can get pencil style torches and things like that too where the consumables all the basics are there but they might hook up a little bit differently to give you better access um, you know they might be lower amperage consumables but you know at the end of the day if you need to get to a weld that's buried inside a head something like that there's a configuration of torch out there somewhere that'll work for you mm-hmm So as we dig into that torch a little bit more, um, one of the big pieces there, Andy was talking about, is the collet, collet body setup. Looking at this picture, um, it's a standard collet, collet body setup. That's the picture you see there with kind of turbulent gas flow. The one on the other side actually has a set of stainless steel screens in there. So that, that basically laminates the gas flow like the aerator does on your faucet at home. So if you take that off your sink at home, turn the water on, water kind of goes everywhere. Um, you put it back on there, you can typically stick your finger underneath the stream of water, it'll hit your finger, it'll come back together on the bottom, because it's more laminar flow. So the gas lens does the th same thing for your shielding gas. Um, aluminum is extremely picky to contamination. So it's one that specifically, if you don't have great shielding gas, you're going to see it in your weld. So for me, I use a gas lens uh, almost all the time, you know, there's very few scenarios where I don't. Uh, but the big advantage to having, other than just better gas flow, even though that gas lens is a little bit bigger and more clumsy, you can typically get a longer stick out on your tungsten and still get adequate penet or adequate gas coverage uh, without sacrificing your weld quality or you know contaminating the weld puddle, something like that. So the rule of thumb for that is typically, and Andy's going to show us here in just a second, a couple different size gas lenses. The rule of thumb for stick out on your tungsten is roughly the length of the opening on that gas lens. So, you know, Andy's got a couple different size ones there. That's going to be why yeah. is, you know, especially you start getting into tubing and stuff like that where you need access. That makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I definitely use a gas lens for most applications. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to flip to a different camera. Uh, so you might be able to see this a little bit better here. So I've got a standard size gas lens on the torch that I'm using today. 
Um, now you can see I have my tux tungsten pulled out a little bit. Now, normally with a regular collet and collet body, once you start pulling your tungsten out, it starts to contaminate somewhat. If you see your tungsten turning blue or purple or black, chances are you're not getting enough argon flow around the tungsten to keep it from contaminating. So the tungsten should look nice and shiny or it shouldn't have any discoloration to it at all as you're using it. Uh, they've color, come in color wise, it should things. look exactly like when you started when you're done. Yes, exactly. So here's a much larger diameter um, gas lens. I like using this when gas flow is critical, especially when you're working with, you know, sense, you know, temperature sensitive base metals like stainless steel or titanium, things that need a lot of gas. And even when I'm working with titanium, I'll add a whole nother set of shielding cups behind this called a trailing gas. And that helps keep the titanium shielded until it gets below 900 degrees, which is kind of that critical point for titanium to be contaminated. So this is also great when working with tubing or in joints that are say outside type corner joints because if you look at an outside corner joint, look at where the tungsten comes out. Now there's nothing balling the argon gas there to keep the weld puddle shielded. The gas is flowing away from your weld puddle. So uh, a gas lens helps that situation as well. Another thing you'll know, like when you get into inside areas, because argon is typically heavier than air, it will have a blanketing effect anyway. So the argon inside of a tight included joint really isn't as big of an issue. But anytime you're working on tubing or outside corner joints, uh, definitely try and upgrade to the, uh, to the gas lens. And we're gonna get back to a question here real quick, but I just wanted to, uh... Take us over to the SEMA booth once again and uh, just say hi to everybody there. So we are here live with you guys. If you guys have questions, again, reach out to Josh, let us know, and we'll get those answered. Um, one of them, Andy, that we do have coming back from the YouTube side of things comes down to your gas lens. Um, and at what point does it need to be replaced? Does it ever get contaminated? They had an issue mm -hmm. where they had one changed out because they started seeing contamination, even though it looked fine. Um, so whether yeah. something maybe got plugged up in there, up in those screens, you want to give them a little help on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And it may not even be, you know, something plugging in from the inside out. Usually the contamination is external. Um, sometimes I'll tell you another thing too. Sometimes they'll be contaminated straight out of the box when new, depending upon if the company that manufactured the gas lens didn't do a post cleaning after assembly. So during assembly, there's different layers of screens that are put together in this system. Um, and if they don't get all the lubricant off during a post cleaning, that lubricant will actually contaminate a brand new gas lens. But yeah. typically the gas lenses will contaminate due to an external cause. So um, you may have contaminated a tungsten at one point and somewhere along the line, some of that oxidation got up inside the gas lens. Now, even if the gas lens looks good, it still could contaminate. Um, that's another good reason that I still go back to group square one is a collet and collet body. It has the least amount of components in it. So you can always go back to a collet and collet body to test if your gas lens is bad because there's no screens. It's just a basic uh, um, four, maybe five, six holes machined into the collet body for gas flow. So it's very simple. So, but yes, I have seen gas and lenses the, go bad. You're gonna probably see that contamination pretty easily with aluminum. You know, any kind of gas contamination shows up in aluminum uh, pretty quickly, but that also holds true for a standard setup as well. You know, like Andy said, if you really contaminate um, a tungsten pretty bad, and especially if you even get your cup that's got that kind of yellow, white, sulfury cloud on it, that can true. recontaminate your weld and your tungsten as well. So any of that kind of stuff, if you have it happening, make sure you change that stuff out. Again, that's why they're technically considered consumables. Because you're just going to end up fighting yourself again. Um, mm -hmm. Another question that we had on gas lenses before we move on to current is, how do you determine hey guys, if you have the correct we do, we argon have a flow rate here with from gas the SEMA lenses? Floor. Okay, let's, we have we're a question gonna, here from the SEMA floor. Yep, let's get this one here. We just started on YouTube, and then we'll come right back to you guys. Okay, thanks. 
so the one from the show or from YouTube was how do you determine if you have the correct argon flow rate with gas lenses? Really, that's going to come down to manufacturer specs. Um, that's something that you should be able to get when you purchase it. Um, but you can imagine, you know, as Andy goes from that smaller gas lens to the larger one, it's going to need more gas in order to keep adequate coverage. So typically, as they get larger, your flow rate's going to go up. But again, you don't and want to go too far with, up yeah. where you start that's creating more any issues. Cup. Yeah, that's true with any cup size. Even with your regular collet and collet bodies, if you bump up your nozzle or cup sizes, you're going to need a little more flow rate. If you go down in cup size, you need to decrease it because as you're squeezing that argon through a, a tighter hole, the pressures become higher and your gas actually becomes more turbulent. So in that case, more gas is not acceptable. It will actually pull in contaminations because it's so forceful. It's like trying to fill a Dixie cup with a fire hose. You know, it's just, it's just got too much power, right? So, you know, if you're working with a number six or number four um, cup size, you may be down in the single digits for cubic feet per hour. Now I'm running uh, like a seven or an eight gas lens. So um, I'm probably up with the gas lens right around 20, 22, but that bigger gas lens that I have, I'm gonna need about 30 for this to be effective. So it's, that is true, but as the orifice size grows, so should your gas flow. Yep, and for the actual setting, you should be able to get that whenever you purchase it. So we'll go back to the SEMA floor here. Um, what do we have for a question here, Rex? Okay, David, right? David? Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the lens can be contaminated right out of the box. Can you clean that to, or can you clean contamination if it gets contaminated after you're using? Or just after um, yeah, it's, it's tough. If the contamination is from the cleaning materials or the oils from assembling and machining, you can soak that thing in some good denatured alcohol would probably be the best way to start try and get it soaked for that and then blow it out real good. Uh, I wouldn't recommend taking it apart. Uh, you're probably best if, if that doesn't work, if a good denatured alcohol soaking doesn't work. Uh, you could try acetone, but you know, acetone still doesn't totally evaporate properly. It's I mean, still a hydrocarbon. It, yeah, and so I would kind of stay away from it for that. I use acetone all day long for wiping materials and cleaning stuff, you know, and even prepping my aluminum. So um, I just wouldn't use it for cleaning the gas lens. And as far as taking them apart, like you said, a lot of times those screens are oriented very specifically. So the minute you take them apart, your performance of those, you know, quality ones are probably going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a follow-up question. Sure. So, yeah. so my uh, redneck impulse to just squirt it with some brake cleaner would be a good idea. That's even worse. Uh, <laughs> brake cleaner you really want to be careful with. Um, number one there is make sure anything that you're using in the welding world is non-chlorinated. Um, but again, you're in that same issue where if, it depends on what the contamination is too. You know, if there's something inside of those screens that's larger than what the screen can let out. You know, if there's a chunk of rubber or, you know, something like that from the manufacturing process that got trapped and you're spraying it with cleaners, you know, you might be breaking it down even more, but it truly can't fit back out the lens. So a lot of times if you see contamination out of the box, it's truly coming from something that was really missed and shouldn't be there. So it's going to be something that typically isn't going to be all that easy to get rid of as well. Yeah. Usually I see the ones out of the box get contaminated. It's usually assembly lube and stuff like that, that this to get cleaned properly. So if it does, if the denatured alcohol doesn't work, pitch it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and start talking a little bit about the actual setup of welding and, and why aluminum is something that's a little bit different um, when it comes to the TIG welding side. So it's definitely a process that's, getting more and more common with home hobby users. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that are kind of intimidated by it. They hear it's different. They want to be really good at it, but they're, you know, think it takes a professional to get to that point. There's a few things that are different, but it's, you know, it's not something that anybody should be intimidated by. It's things we can work around, but most of the uh, kind of challenges that we run into while welding aluminum come from what makes it 
a really nice material for us to weld on. So aluminum oxide is what gives aluminum a lot of its characteristics that we're looking for, you know, great corrosion resistance and things like that. It's extremely thin on the surface. Um, and anything that's anodized is basically just taking that oxide layer and growing it even thicker to make it have more properties. But again, that is making it even worse to weld. And the reason why, number one, is it's extremely hard compared to the aluminum. And then the second biggest issue with it is the fact that it melts at about 3,600 degrees F, where the aluminum itself melts around 1228. So if anybody's ever started venturing down welding on aluminum, either with TIG or not, and you look at the backside of the weld and it looks like bubble gum, um, you know, that only thing that might have kept that from falling through is the oxide layer on the back or your bench. But that oxide layer is so strong, again, it's hanging on there on the backside if it was something that was off the bench. But it never really welded well because on the surface, it was just floating around. Uh, so it's something that to weld, we need to get rid of one way or the other. We'll talk about a few different ways to do that. Um, but your best kind of procedure is starting out with cleaning the material before you start welding. Then we'll talk about how AC current helps us with that. And then a little bit later on, we'll talk about balance control, which is something else that we can help in the process with. Um, but Andy, you want to cover a little bit, even just starting on what do you do for basic material prep before we truly even strike an arc? Sure. Yeah. So for me, um, you know, the best practices is always to try and remove some of that mechanically first. Um, I use a dedicated brush that's just for aluminum. It's a stainless steel brush. And what, what happens is, like Trav said, that oxide layer is so hard that you, you, if this is a critical component, I don't think I would just rely on the welding machine's ability to, to help chip that oxide off. I would want to start that myself first. So while you're brushing it, you'll find as you start brushing your, your aluminum that the aluminum is actually quite hard. It's almost like brushing a piece of glass. The wire brush slides across it real easy. But as you start removing that oxide layer, you'll see that it, the resistance starts going way up on the, on the brush. And now that's your indication that you got that oxide layer off because the softer aluminum underneath it is starting to grab the bristles of the brush. So that's a good indication that you've brushed enough of that oxide layer off. You'll then, also see if you got a couple tacks on it and then try to reclean it. Once it's got a little bit of heat built up into it, it will come off a lot easier as well versus what it does cold. Um, but the other piece of that too, you know, aluminum, if you look at it under a microscope, looks like a bunch of fingers and it just wants to grab contamination. So like Andy said, if I take a, a steel um, versus stainless steel brush, or if I take a stainless steel brush that I went in, you know, went and got some rust off a piece of material and I come back and try to clean my aluminum with it, those fingers are going to grab that contamination and you're going to see an orange flame as soon as you strike that arc. So that's why we want to dedicate that brush to only cleaning the aluminum because it is very susceptible to grabbing contamination off from that. The other piece too is, you know, once you start cleaning this stuff, keep in mind you also want to clean your filler material um, if possible because that's got that same oxide layer on it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. After I brush it, you'll notice there's some of that oxide dust um, on the aluminum. So you can wipe that off. This is where I use a little bit of that acetone. I just have some in a little pump bucket here, a plunger can, and I just wipe that off. So you can see that exactly where I brushed it just by looking at it. Yeah, you can see where you view. turn that just a little. Yep, right there. You can see that. Yeah spot in the middle okay. that looks different than it does on the rest of the cube line. And that's basically the re reflection changing of the light. Yeah. And I, I've got a good example of that too. So I've got coupons here and there are basically what I have right now is all the same alloy of aluminum. And I've got some that is a newer piece and some that is an older piece. They're saying the same alloy, but they look different. So if you look at it from one of my other cameras, you might be able to see this view a little bit better. I'll set these two pieces side by side and you can see that one is a lot more shinier than the other one. Yeah, and you can okay, see that so, if you tip it back, you can see that reflection yeah. onto the table um, when you got it sitting down there, how much shinier that is because of the reflection. Again, the same, same right. kind of thing as what we saw on that where you brushed it in the middle. And you can see so that one laying on the bench right there. Um, you can see that middle 
easily defined right there where the middle looks more like the coupon on uh you know the newer side in front of andy versus mm -hmm. the older contaminated one so Fair and again right. that's something that if you can get rid of it on your filler material um, a lot of people use scotch bright for that or some kind of remover like that you have to be careful with those because they're also petroleum based so if you use something like scotch bright you want to make sure and clean it after that as well um mm -hmm. And a lot of your basic prep too, you know, we're going to jump into AC, but basic material prep, you want to make sure that you're not using aluminum flap wheels and things like that. They're taking that oxide layer and just jamming it further down into the surface. Or if it's something that's cut, you know, you want to make sure it was cut on a saw that leaves you a good clean edge and not one that heated it and kind of smeared the edge. So a lot of times, you know, real critical stuff will actually have, you know, maybe a 16th to an eighth of an inch taken off the coupon with, a harder process like a, a carbide burr or a file before you weld it uh, because of that kind of contamination as well. So one of the main things starting out aluminum that I'll preach day in and day out is your material being clean from the beginning is going to set you up a whole lot better from the beginning because you're going to fight that oxide layer the whole way through if you don't. The machine, so you'll hear us talk about AC, um, the 220 AC DC, that's the big difference. So why do we need AC? Andy's going to cover this a little bit more, but ultimately it comes back to breaking up that oxide layer versus um, versus relying on it completely mechanically. The machine's going to help us out with some of that as well. So Andy's going to explain how we do that with AC current. Yeah. So when you're welding with TIG, um, you have different polarities, right? You have electropositive, you have electronegative. When TIG welding steels, we're using electronegative. Uh, and the reason for that is the current flows from negative to positive. So if the tungsten, if we say the electronegative, right? The tungsten is negative at that point and your workpiece is positive. So 70% or more of the arc energy energy is being deposited on your workpiece. And that's great because that's where the welding needs to be done. Now on the flip side of that, if we go to DC electrode positive, now the current is flowing from your base metal piece up to the tungsten. Now all that energy is being deposited on the tungsten. Well, the advantage of that is since current is flowing that way, it helps chip the oxides off the aluminum and the gas ions floated away from the piece. So what we really need is a combination of that, and that's alternating current, which for one half cycle, the electrode is positive and cleaning, and the other half cycle, the electrode is negative, and it's penetrating the piece. So you get cleaning and welding, cleaning and welding, right? So that is what we need to use to get the proper amount of cleaning and the proper amount of weld potential into your workpiece. We're gonna be working with AC. Now, newer machines, we can adjust that ability to clean the aluminum. There's an adjustment on the newer machines called balance. On the older machines, we didn't have that. You had 50% welding and 50% cleaning. And what? what that caused was your tungstens to erode. So if you went back to that electropositive picture, Trav, you'll see that your tungstens are grabbing all that energy and it's starting to destroy your tungsten. So your tungsten starts to ball up. Now, years ago, that was an advantage because of the way the machines were designed. The AC was what we call sinusoidal, like the one that's on the screen now. It has a real soft curve to it. And as it transitions through the zero point of the waveform, it's not doing it instantaneously. So there's an area there in the middle where the arc becomes very unstable. And that big ball helps catch the current coming back the other way. So it actually helps stabilize the arc. Well, now with the new square wave machines, it goes from positive down through negative instantly. So you don't have that arc fluttering anymore and you have a much more positive transition from the positive to the negative. So now we don't need that big ball on the machine anymore. And so we adjust that with a control called balance and we'll get into what balance does too. Yep, and like Andy said, this this is an old sine wave, you know. So this is technology from the '50s into the '60s. As we start looking at some of the older synchro waves and things like that, so when Andy's saying this actually squares off, and that line gets almost vertical. With the newer inverters of today, that line is 
truly vertical and we can actually break this wave apart and change every side of it if we wanted to. But the big advantage there is we don't have that inconsistency across the zero gap where the arc is going to go out. The newer machines, we can actually take high frequency, which was another part that helped stabilize that arc and get rid of it completely. Um, in doing that, that's also going to change our tungsten prep. So that's something that, you know, on the older style machines, as we looked at tungsten, they were always going to be a green tungsten. Um, that's going to be a pure tungsten in order to get that nice ball on there. You know, some of them we'd change up a little bit if we needed to go to x-ray quality. They'd use a little bit different tungsten. But all in all, that procedure was pretty much the same. Use a green one, take a big piece of copper, turn it on ECP, DCEP, and put a big ball on the end of that tungsten. Like Andy said, if we look at the picture, that ball is larger than the diameter of the electrode. And that arc would wander quite a bit. On these newer style machines, we're going to use a different style tungsten uh, or a different chemical mix of tungsten. And we're going to prep it a little bit differently. So Andy, you want to talk a little bit about what is the ideal tungsten prep today? Um, and if we talk about electrodes of today, you know, what, what is yeah. kind of the standard out of the box and why? Yeah, so today, today with the newer machines, and you can even still apply this to some of the older square wave machines too, not so much on the older sinusoidal machines, but the original square wave machines, we've pretty much transitioned to one type of tungsten that it has great characteristics across DC applications for all your steel, stainless steel, titanium, and that stuff. And it's great also for your AC work. So we're working now with a tungsten called seriated. And if you look on the table of elements, you'll see cerium is an element. And how, how the tungsten gets its operating characteristic as the tungsten is being manufactured, they dope cerium with the tungsten, and you get these seriated tungsten. Now, the rare earth element that you're applying to the tungsten will also give it some of those characteristics that are a little bit different, which is why pure tungsten, which doesn't have any of those, tends to ball up the tungsten real quick. It doesn't have the temperature operating characteristics that these newer tungstens have. Now, if you're familiar with the red tungstens from yesteryear, the thoriated, that is a DC, typically a DC only tungsten. Now the seriated, you prep it the same way you would those older red thoriated tungstens. We wanna sharpen it to a point, okay? So uh, sharpening it to a point, we wanna make sure that we're grinding our points that the striations are actually flowing the same direction as the tungsten. Don't grind it circular like you would say on a, like a pencil sharpener would, you know, make sure your grinding wheel is vertical and the same direction as your tungsten. Um, and a lot of times reason, where we see those circular striations going the wrong way is for anybody who's grinding them on a pedestal grinder. You know, a lot of times it's a lot less intimidating grinding it on the side of that wheel versus on the face of it. Cause you think it's going to be maybe a little bit safer and it's not going to try to grab it. But again, that creates that striation going the wrong direction. Um, you know, there's different wheels out there if you are using a pedestal grinder, but another big hint there is to make sure you keep it dressed. Um, if you don't, a lot of times we saw it even, you know, going back into school, you get this nice groove worn in a pedestal grinder. It really works nice to set that in there to grind. But the problem is that'll actually grind it into a bell shape versus a true point. Uh, but that is one of the most common places that I would say I see these striation marks being done wrong. Um, yeah. So just another kind of side note there for you. Yeah. And now for me, I mean, I use these hand, you know, grinders. These have a diamond grit wheel in them. Um, they also have a machined head on the side. This one particular one does. So that has different point angles. Um, so this is simple. It's just put the tungsten in. Nice. Spin, nice it for a, spin it for a couple seconds and it puts a perfect point on it. So that's kind of what I use, you know, if I can, it puts a nice point on it again. And it's, it's a, it's a very uh, fine grind. You don't want to use a heavy grind grit when doing the tungsten because tungsten doesn't grind, it chips. Every time you chipping the tungsten, that could be a flare off point for the current. You know, it's again why that's if you grind a tungsten wrong, as the current is flowing down the tungsten, if it hits those circular striations, you could have arc flaring off of those rather than following it all the way to the point. 
And this is especially critical if you're doing low amperage TIG, because when you're at the real low amperages, now that amperage, what you'll find is it starts wandering around the workpiece and it doesn't stay steady off the point. So prepping your tungsten is critical, believe it or not. Um, and again, like Trav mentioned earlier on the brushes, dedicate your grinding wheel to nothing but tungsten, because if you're grinding steel or something else, or, or even aluminum on that wheel, you're gonna embed that into the tungsten. So you'll see an immediate contamination if you're using something else to grind your tungsten uh, with. And we'll come back to the booth here in just a second, see if we have any more questions, but I do see Robert has a question. Um, going down the what angle do we use in our tungsten which is right where we're headed um great so yeah. once we learn what direction to sharpen that point the next point that we have to talk about is what difference does that make um you know for me i would have originally assumed and it's something that we see quite a bit you know it was just my instinctive thought that if i have a nice big steep taper on there that i was truly going to get a smaller weld, weld puddle um, and that's actually opposite of what we see because that arc comes off from the tungsten at about a 90 degree angle. Um, so that's coming back to like Andy said, if your tungsten is not dressed properly and you hit those striations as you start going down the tungsten, the arc wants to jump. And that's part of why um, is how that current is flowing down to the point. And it typically doesn't make it quite all the way to the bottom. Like you see here in these diagrams, that arc breaks off just before the point. Um, you know, it's not always halfway down that taper. It's typically a little bit closer to the point, but then it jumps off at a 90 degree angle. So the less angle you have on your tungsten, the steeper the point, the wider your weld is going to get. Um, you know, so what angle do we use? That all depends on your project. I would say, you know, right around a 30 is probably extremely common. But if you truly want to start changing your arc, you have that ability in that grind angle. Right. Yeah. So yeah. for my, most of my purposes, I stick with the 30, the 30 degree. And, um, you know, with aluminum, you know, one of the adjustments we have on the machine, most of the machines that we produce now, anyway, there's a, another feature. We're not going to get into it in real depth, but there's another feature called frequency control. Now the frequency, it focuses the arc, the higher the number, the tighter the arc, the lower the number, the lazier the arc. So, I can control the arc width much better with the machine's capability instead of trying to grind my tungsten at different tapers. Now, if you're welding with DC TIG, now you can adjust your grind taper for the joint kind of application you want if you want it to work that way. And if we look at this graphic that's up there, you know, if we go back to the, the basics of the TIG side of things, again, you're going to get a little bit of a ball on the end of that tungsten. So after we grind it to a point, what we're going to recommend is you take your grinder and knock the tip off from there just so that ball doesn't get too big. Um, if you look at the end of that top tungsten, there is a small ball on the end of there, but it's not nearly, you know, anywhere near the diameter of the tungsten like it would have been in the past or larger. Um, so you still have a much more controllable arc versus what you did in the past. But again, if you don't knock that tip off from there, that ball is going to keep growing and it's going to be larger than what you really truly need. Um, so you're, you're set up a little bit better if you take the time to do that. Another note, going back to what Andy had said earlier, tungsten's extremely brittle. Um, so you want to make sure you're not clipping that off with a pair of cutters, because a lot of times you'll put a crack right through the center of that tungsten. And as you start adding heat to it, you'll see that tungsten start to split um, because it can't handle just being cut off like that without you know cracking. So you want to make sure you're doing that with a grinder. Um, and not a set of pliers or something like that. And it's the same thing if you get, you know, you touch the tungsten, you dip it in the puddle, whatever, you get a big piece of aluminum on there, you want to get it cleaned up. Take the time and do that with the grinder. Don't try to cut it off because you're going to end up in the same boat. And then once it's cracked, you're going to take that whole thing and throw it in the garbage because you're never going to catch up to that crack. It's going to keep propagating as you put heat into it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something yeah. that's important as well. Another reason I like these, they actually have a cutting portion of these hand grinders too so as we keep going um another advantage that we have in the newer equipment like andy had talked a little bit about earlier is going to be balance control so this is going to be something that can help you fine tune your cleaning more than like andy said earlier we typically don't want you to rely on this as your only method of cleaning but it will help uh, for anybody who started tig welding already on aluminum 
we'll hear it a lot of times is pepper on the puddle. You know, so if you're welding and you see that floating on top, a lot of times that can, on the newer equipment, be maybe one or two points uh, of cleaning adjustment. And you can get rid of that. Uh, the older equipment might have had a knob on the front of it that talked about cleaning your balance control. But realistically, if we look at it at the scale that's in the newer machines, like the Dynasty or the 220, something like that, where it calls it out as a percentage, the older machines were maybe 68 to you know 65, 68, maybe 70 is what you would get out of them on this knob versus, you know, these newer equipment, we can go to from one to 99. Um, so Andy, you want to tell us a little bit about what is balance control and how does that affect our cleaning action? Yeah, sure. So again, when we talked about electropositive, electronegative, one of them penetrates, that's the negative and electropositive cleans. So if you look at that picture that Trav has up there, you'll see that the electropositive side is set at 32% and the electronegative is at 68%. That means in that one cycle, I'm at the welding potential 68% of the time and I'm only cleaning 32%. Now, there is only a few microns of oxidation on the aluminum. So you don't need 50% of your arc cleaning that oxide layer off because what that's going to do is going to put a real wide white etching area next to the weld bead. And that's because you've cleaned this much aluminum, but you only welded this much. So what's on the outside of that edge is that cleaning zone. So now we have the ability to adjust that tighter to the weld bead, you know, and for aesthetics, it's, it's great because you don't have this white flaky stuff next to the weld bead. It looks better if you're doing any post weld treatment or anodizing to the weld afterwards, your post weld cleanup is minimal because you can fine tune that cleaning zone. But the, the critical thing to remember is make sure you do see it a little bit. There still should have some there because you're gonna end up with that peppering or some of that oxide floating in your weld puddle if you don't clean enough. So as we talk balance, in our heads, we're thinking the cleaning zone, but the number you see on the, on the dial and the number you see on your screen as you're adjusting it, it's actually the number that refers to the welding side or the electronegative side. So in order to get more cleaning, you actually have to turn the balance number down, okay? So down actually gives you more cleaning, up gives you more welding time. So I don't know if that makes sense, probably doesn't, but that number, that well, number how you, references. Yeah, how, how you wanna think about it is if I've got it set at 75, I'm going to be welding 75% of the time, the balance of that is what I'm gonna spend cleaning. So if I need more time cleaning, yeah. I need to go down on my welding time. Yeah, and you'll notice on the inverter machines that our factory default, when it leaves the factory, is set for 75, which means typically we're only cleaning the oxide layer off 25% of the time. And that gives you a fairly good cleaning zone. I tend to err a little bit. I'd be a little bit more cautious on most of my stuff. I started at like 73, and then I turn it up from there if I need to. But another reason you'll want to adjust this is for your joint design. I talked about those outside corners earlier um, when you're working with gas lenses. Well, the same holds true for balance control because when you're coming at this piece to weld it, right? You're coming it this way. And what happens is your base metal is falling away from the tungsten. So it's further away and it needs more cleaning so you can get down the side of that piece to clean it properly. So on this piece, I'd probably run my tungsten or my cleaning maybe all the way down to 70, you know, maybe even 68, just to make sure that I had enough cleaning on the outside toes of the weld. Now, inverse to that, when you're welding inside a tight area, now the base metal is closer to the tungsten and it cleans easier. So for that, I would turn my balance up to 78, 76, maybe even 80, you know, and that would give me the proper cleaning for this type of weld joint. Is it bad to overclean? No, it's not bad. You can have your machine set at 70 all day, every day if you want. But keep in mind that to it does a put a little extent. more heat. Yeah, it puts a little more heat on the tungsten. So you'll start consuming your tungstens a little faster. Your arc will be a little bit wider, um, you know, but, but it doesn't 
it doesn't affect the arc or the weld puddle strength wise. So and that was something that Robert came on and was you were basically right on the right page, and I know you saw we answered that, but he was saying basically 75 out of the box, and then if it is dirty material, take the dynasty down to 65 to 55. Realistically, I don't think I hardly ever go under 65. Um, for me, if it's under 65, in order to get it clean, that means I needed to do some more cleaning beforehand. Um, so really, I only, you know, it's 65 to 75 is probably my, about my biggest window like Andy said, other than maybe on an inside corner. So you're definitely right on par there. Um, Jeremy's also asking about that tungsten grinder. So uh, I don't know, Andy, if your camera will zoom in on that tag on the side of that thing, but that one that Andy has there is made by Orbitalum, um, which is another ITW company. Um, so you can look that one up, but there are various different manufacturers out there, but I don't know the model of that one offhand, but that one used to be... Um, part of one of our other sister brands that went to Orbitalum. Um, so that's where you yeah. can find that one. Yeah. And there are other, there are other, I would say affordable options. Um, they're kind of more like a modified Dremel tool with a head that's positioned on it. So you'll, you're going to get into those in that, you know, 200 to 300 mark, you know, something that I would step into something like that. Maybe if, unless you're doing it all day, every day, and it's kind of a production thing where you're sharpening tungstens. Now for me too, when I switch materials, if I'm welding steel and I go to aluminum, I'll pull the tungsten out, even if it's good. And I'll redress the tungsten and put it back in just so that I have a fresh tungsten when I'm working with aluminum, because even though your steel is somewhat cleaner, there is still some contaminations that could be pulled to the tungsten that you don't see. So I have a tendency to just redress my tungsten every time I switch materials. Um, but uh, yeah, I have a number of different types of tungsten grinders. Um, let's see. I don't know if I've got one in this one or not. And like I said, the biggest thing but, we see out there quite common is a pedestal grinder. They make tungsten grinding wheels for them. But again, make sure you take those and dedicate them to grinding tungsten. Keep them dressed, um, and that will help you, again, fight that arc flare. So we can go back to the booth here real quick, see if we got any more questions there. Um, if not, we're going to start going to the giveaway section where we're going to ask some questions. Uh, everybody in the booth is going to be a separate giveaway from all of you in YouTube land. Um, so anybody that's in the booth, your, your go-to guy for the answers are going to be Josh. So whoever Josh hears, raises his hand, whatever he wants to do there in the booth, he's your guy. Um, anybody that's on YouTube as we ask the question, it's going to come down to whoever shows up on our chat log as the first correct answer. So make sure you guys are ready to answer in the chat function in YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions of how they show up, make sure you reach out to us at the end. Uh, we've seen quite a bit where what we get back as a chat log at Miller is a little bit different than what you guys see on your end based on your internet connection, that kind of thing. Um, and then we've got the Shop Talk Live email is going to be up as well. So if anybody that wins, we want to make sure, on YouTube anyway, anybody that wins, we want to make sure you email us your contact information so um, we can actually get you your prize. So any other questions in the booth before we go ahead and get started with that? Guys, I think we're clear on questions out here, but we are good to go for the contest. So just let us know. I'll mute the mic so we don't uh, throw out any answers to you guys. <laughs> Rattle trap. I'm hoping that's Stacy out there. But yes, this will be on YouTube um, prior or post production here. This one will go up on YouTube as well. Um, there's also some of these out there that we've done in the past. This GTAW basics on aluminum is. A topic Andy and I see filled every time we teach it. Um, so that's something that we try to cover for you guys over and over again as everybody starts up on the aluminum side of things. So yeah, and I would I would uh, I would also recommend beginners to check out on our YouTube channel. I'll, I've done a couple of TIG welding aluminum basics, everything from holding the torch. It's uh, it's like a four step video, so it kind of steps you through kind of training and getting used to holding the torch, travel speed, adding the filler metal. Each one of those is a different action and you almost need some exercises to train each one of those separately before you even turn your machine off and start making scrap. So check out some of those videos. It's like a four-step video series on TIG welding aluminum. 
again, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, shop talk live at millerwelds.com. Anything you guys would like to see in future episodes, feel free to share that there as well. Um, but again, thank you for joining us today. And we'll we'll see you on the next edition. Um, and we'll see you on the next SEMA edition on this one, the Shop Talk Live with Miller. So we appreciate thanks. everybody's time today. And thanks for joining. Have a great day. Andy Travis, everybody, thanks. Great day here at SEMA 2021.